Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Talking Hockey Sense. I'm Chris Peters. This is episode 114 as we continue on season. It's the end of the season. The postseason is upon us for many, and the college hockey season just ended. We are going to talk about Denver's epic national championship win at the men's frozen four. We are also going to talk about the just released NHL central scouting rankings. I haven't even really had a chance to look at them yet. So you are going to get my live honest reaction to that list as it comes out. After we talk a little frozen four, we're also going to preview the Kelly cup playoffs in the ECHL. The USHL playoffs are underway and we'll also preview the upcoming under 18 world men's championship, which I will be going to in Finland in a couple of weeks here. So a lot happening very much going on and we got to get to all of it before we do get into it want to remind you if you haven't yet subscribe to this podcast on your podcast app of choice you can also watch us on youtube at the flow hockey's youtube page you can watch us on flowhockey.tv or via the flow sports app and make sure you are subscribed to flow hockey to get access to a tremendous amount of postseason hockey across the u.s and canada we've got junior a throughout canada we've got the USHL, we've got the NCDC playoffs going on, ECHL, SPHL, so much happening right now on Flow Hockey, so there has never been a better time to subscribe. But we're going to turn our focus back to college hockey for just a little bit here as we get to the Frozen Four and Denver for the 10th time, a record 10th national championship. The Denver Pioneers have done it once again. Second in three years, second for head coach David Carl, and what a performance it was. A 2 nothing shutout of Boston College, one of the best offensive teams in the country, and it did not matter. Matt Davis was incredible. 23 saves in the third period alone against BC as the Eagles threw everything at him, but it didn't matter. A 979 save percentage for Davis throughout the NCAA tournament. He allowed just three goals over four games. I mean, you got to be exceptional to try to win that one. And uh, basically nobody could beat him. It was incredible. I mean, you look at the, what they did. Double overtime win over UMass. An overtime win over BU. They had a tight game against Cornell. And then, of course, you have this incredible final against Boston College where everything came together. Zeev Booyam collects his 50th point of the season. He's only the second U19 defenseman in NCAA history. Second in NCAA history to eclipse the 50 mark. Pretty incredible what he did this year. When you think about all the great defensemen that have played in college hockey as U19 players, we're talking Quinn Hughes, we're talking about Kale McCarr, we're talking about all these players, and Zeev Booyam in his draft-eligible season with 50 points for a national championship team. Insane, incredible. And we will talk a little bit more about Zeev Booyam uh, when we talk about our NHL Central scouting rankings because he took a little bit of a jump in the North American skater rankings. And we'll talk about that. I'll preview it a little bit now, but he moved up to fourth among North American skaters. So that just goes to show you the respect that Zeev Booyam has garnered this year as a draft eligible player. Major minutes for Denver. And, and what a tremendous job he did you know i talked a lot before the lead up about how denver was able to win with everybody and that they didn't necessarily have the same level of star power as boston university and boston college now, at least not in the same number but zeev booyam was that star player and my, my buddy Corey Promen set me straight on the uh the athletic hockey show podcast this week as well where we were talking about that and he's like hey Zeb Booyam is a bona fide star and went with with how early we expect him to go in the draft now pretty incredible so Zeb Booyam a world junior gold medal he scored a goal in the gold medal game by the way and a national championship in his draft eligible season it doesn't get much better than that for a draft eligible defenseman. So that will absolutely help his draft stock. But if there's one person that I think everybody's talking about coming out of this tournament, it's the head coach of Denver, David Carl. He was the head coach of the world junior team for team USA. He wins the world junior gold medal. And then he wins his second national title. He is 34 years old. Now we've got a great feature on flowhockey.tv that you can see exclusively there. Uh, we talked to, to David Carl at the, at, 
it was actually last summer that we talked to him. He was taking recruiting calls. He was doing all this stuff. And he sat down with us for an interview to talk about the World Junior Championship and his career as a whole. And if you don't know the David Carl story, uh, it's pretty famous. But it, just to recap quickly, uh, he went to the NHL scouting combine as a as a draft hopeful. Uh, he was playing at Shattuck St. Mary's. He was a highly regarded player, expected to be drafted in the NHL. They found an abnormality when they were doing their medical testing. They find out that he has a heart condition that will basically force him to retire at 18 years old. The University of Denver honored his scholarship. They they put, brought him along with the team. He started as a student manager, then was a student coach, a graduate assistant, gets his first full-time job in the USHL with the Green Bay Gamblers. It wasn't very long that... Jim Montgomery got the job at Denver and everybody sang the praises of David Carl and David Carl was back on the Denver bench as an assistant. So he's been an assistant for a national championship and a head coach for two. Jim Montgomery, of course, has now been in the NHL for multiple years, having coached the Dallas Stars and now the Boston Bruins and helped them win a president's trophy last year. So that is the coaching tree. And the, the other guy that, that David Carl worked for was Derek Lalonde at the Green Bay Gamblers in the USHL. He's now the head coach of the Detroit Red Wings. So you look at David Carl and you say, this guy is the future of NHL coaching. This is a guy that is going to have a tremendous career. And he's already done it. At 34 years old, two national titles. And really, you look at Denver, and aside from Zeev Booyam, they tend not to get that high-level first-round draft prospect. They get them sometimes. They get guys like, you know, Paul Stasny. And they get guys like Matt Carl back in the day, David's brother. You know, they get other other players. But it's not as much as like a BC or a Michigan or a BU where they're continually getting those guys. But every guy that leaves Denver seems to leave Denver better when then they arrived. And I think that's true of Zeev Booyam. You look at the development that he's had this year. You say, I mean, he was a very good defenseman last year for the U18 team, but he came into this season. Not a lot of people believed he was a first round draft prospect. Now he's a top five draft pro draft prospect. It's incredible. So the job that David Carl has done at Denver, truly remarkable. He will be a big time coaching candidate in the NHL. And I think he's really going to be able to pick his spot when the opportunity arises. I don't think he's going to jump at the first job that becomes available. I don't think he's going to get jump at necessarily the first thing that he's offered even. I just think that he's going to make sure that he finds the right fit. He's a young guy. He's he's still younger than some of the guys in the NHL right now. And so that's going to be a great thing for him. But David Carl, congratulations to him. Congratulations to the Denver Pioneers. Ten national titles more than any program in history. And if you talk to any of those players, any of those coaches, anybody that works there, getting number 10 was on their mind the whole time of this playoff run. They played the absolute, one of the most dominant in terms of their defensive and goaltending play that we've seen. One of the most dominant runs to a national title in recent memory. Truly remarkable. Congratulations to the pioneers. All right. So as I mentioned, just as we were starting the recording of this podcast, we knew it was coming. The NHL central scouting rankings have been released. And so I'm going to give you my honest reaction to what we saw. And really you look at what NHL central scouting does. They kind of act like the 33rd NHL team their list also separates North American and European, so it's not a one-to-one -one in terms of what will be the top, you know, what that kind of breakdown will be because you look at the two. But unsurprisingly, Macklin Celebrini, number one on the list for North America. What might be, you know, I think there's debate even in Russia between these two players, but Anton Salaev was number one European skater. Ivan Demidov, number two. Um, and those are two guys that obviously have a lot of uh, respect in terms of the scouting community, in terms of what they can be as NHL players. But those two guys are one and two. Uh, Konsta Hellenius is number three. And what a season he's had in Finland. He's currently with the Finnish senior national team trying to get a spot on the senior team. And speaking of that, Elliot Friedman on the 32 Thoughts podcast reported that Macklin Celebrini has been invited to play for Team Canada at the Men's World Championship. So here's a guy that was playing the under 18 Worlds last year, the World Juniors this year is an underage, and now at 17 years old, he has been invited to play for Team Canada at the World Championship. And 
both Canada and the United States are bringing wagon teams. They're bringing established NHLers because we are in an Olympic cycle. Now that the NHL players are back, Bill Guerin has made it very clear and Doug Armstrong has made it very clear. If you want to be a, considered for the Olympics and you're a bubble guy, you better go to the World Championship so we can see you in some high-level competition. That is where they're going. So Celebrini get an opportunity amid all that. Really, really impressive. The number two skater is the guy that was number two on my list at the midterm as well, and that's Artem Levshinov, the defenseman from Michigan State. And I think he further solidified himself as a top-tier draft prospect with his play at Michigan State this year. Major minutes, number one defenseman on a team that was one of the top four teams in the country going into the national tournament. They didn't reach the Frozen Four, but they did win the Big Ten tournament this year. Artem Levshinov is one of those guys that really just makes tremendous plays and also a guy that I think we're going to be talking a lot more about as, you know, potentially the top defenseman in this draft. I think you can argue for Silayev. You can argue for Caden Lindstrom, or sorry, not Caden Lindstrom, Carter Yakumchuk. You can argue for Zane Parekh and Zeev Booyam and, and Sam Dickinson. You can argue for all those players to be in that tier. But I really do think that of those players, Artem Levshinov is the most complete package among defensemen. And so that's why I think both Central Scouting, myself, a lot of others believe that he could be the number two pick in this draft. He's a right shot defenseman. He's 6'2", over 200 pounds. He's He had 35 points this year, which is more than Quinn Hughes, more than Owen Power, more than Zach Wierenski, more than Noah Hannafin in their draft eligible seasons. And, you know, some of those guys like Wierenski and Hannafin accelerated their schooling, but Levshinov is a late birth date like Quinn Hughes and Owen Power, who, and, and you know, that's, it, it's incredible what, what Levshinov did this year. At number three on Central Scouting, it is Caden Lindstrom. And Lindstrom uh, has been dealing with some injuries. We're going to talk a little bit about him. He's not going to be with Team Canada, according to my pal Corey Promen, who reported that neither Cat, Berkeley Catton or Caden Lindstrom will be at the Under-18 World Championship. Lindstrom has been dealing with injuries throughout the year. He ends up, you know, his, his, his regular season total, 32 games played, 27 goals, and 46 points. So, the question is, is the sample size large enough to judge him against some of the other players? It you know, basically looks similar to some of the college players that we're talking about in terms of 32 games, and plus he got some playoff games as well. But that's where he's at. So number three is Caden Lindstrom of the Medicine Hat Tigers. Would have loved to have seen him at the World Under-18 Championship. I think he would have been a huge difference maker for Team Canada. Alas, we will not see that. At number four, as we mentioned, Zeev Booyam. I mean, how can you argue with a guy that had 50 points in his college season, one of only two players at his age, at his position, to eclipse the 50-point mark in college hockey? Dynamic, shifty, incredible with the puck on his stick, but also I think his defense improved. I think that was a big part of why Denver was successful down the stretch is guys like him and his brother Shy and Sean Barron's. They, they all played much better defensively than they did earlier in the season, much more disciplined, much more consistent. I think Zeb Bouillon brought a level of consistency this year that, that really established him as one of these top tier prospects. And also, you know, he, he did grow a bit from year over year. He's about six feet tall. Now, um, you know, he got a little bit stronger. He'll continue to get stronger. Um, his older brother is six foot two. So maybe, you know, there's a chance that he grows a little bit more too. a lot to figure out there. But after Zeev Bouillon, it goes to Zane Parekh. And is Parekh, 96 points in the OHL this season. I mean, just an, a remarkable run for him with the, the with the point production. I mean, you know, the, the amount of goals he scores. Another 30-goal season, 33 goals scored by Zane Parekh this year. And so he's now coming in at number five. So we were talking about those. We've got three defensemen in the top five. And then you even go further. you got Trevor Connolly at number six from the Tri-City Storm. 78 points in 52 games this year for the Storm currently in the playoffs. It'll be interesting to see. We've talked about him. The, you know, the the where he goes in the draft is a lot less to do with his talent, a lot more to do about the character assessment the teams continue to do, the interviews they continue to do with them, the background checks they continue to do with him. That's going to determine ultimately where he goes. I think on talent alone, is he a top 10 prospect? I think you can make that case. Um, but on all that other stuff, could he – Go further down in the first round, I believe he can. Um, he might be one of those guys that falls a little bit, and then a team has a decision to make later in the draft or later in the first round. You know, do you take the shot at the value there, or are the concerns enough that you 
just pass and move on to the next player. So we'll see where that all goes. Sam Dickinson, defenseman from London at seven. Uh, Berkeley Catton at eight. Tija Ginla at number nine. He's still alive in the WHL playoffs, uh, playing with the Kelowna Rockets and a tremendous season. He had, of course, the son of uh, Jerome Ginla. Another USHLer at number 10, Michael Hage, big, big mover up the list. Michael Hage had finished the season with 75 points. He was averaging close to two points a game at the end of the season. He really went on a tear, helped Chicago get into the USHL Clark Cup playoffs. I believe he did sustain an injury in, a, in one of their playoff games. Um, and so we'll have to see exactly where uh, that goes here. But that is a player that I think has a lot of fans and, and a growing fan base among NHL scouts because of the run that he went on in the second half of the season uh, to help get his team there. Carter Yakumchuk comes in at number 11. Cole Eiserman now down to 12th, so the tumble continues for him despite the fact that he's just a goal away from his 50th of the season. Heading into the World Under-18 Championship, a lot to prove for him. Beckett Seneca from Oshawa, he's had a tremendous postseason. He could be rising up the list as well because of his postseason play. 68 points in 63 regular season games. Liam Greentree from the Windsor Spitfires at 14. Tarek Parasak at 15 from Prince George. Sasha Boisvert from the Muskegon Lumberjacks in the USHL comes in at number 16. Merrick Vanneker coming in uh, at, from Brantford at 17. A big mover there as well. Had 82 points this season for Brantford. And then Julius Mietinen at 18, Ryder Ritchie at 19, Jet Luchenko at 20, Matt Vay Gridden at 21, Adam Jesho at 22, Dean Letourneau moving up to number 23, plays for St. Andrews College, and Sam O'Reilly at number 24, and Cole Bodoin uh, from Barry at number 25. That rounds out the top 25 North American skaters from NHL Central scouting. It's always interesting to look at their list, see where they have certain guys. Um, but I think the real telling thing is that Zeev Booyam has made a significant push into the top five conversation. Uh, that is a big, big factor there. Zane Parekh, same thing. Incredible, productive season. And then as it comes to the Europeans, Silaev, Demidov, Hellenius, the clear top Europeans. I think the consensus top Europeans. It'll be interesting to see where certain guys go. Konsta Hellenius, really, it, it cannot be overstated. He had a tremendous year in, in Finland, now playing with the senior national team. If he gets a shot with their senior national team at the Men's World Championship and shows well there, you know, could he move even further up the draft list? I think that is absolutely possible. Um, rounding out the top five of the North of the European skaters, just to close the loop on that, Adam Juracek, the defenseman from Pilsen, and Michael Brantseg Nygaard, the uh, Norwegian from um, playing currently in, in Sweden with Mora, just a tremendous competitor, a guy that plays a hard nosed game. Um, you know, those are the guys that we think will probably be safely into the first round discussion among those players. One guy that's not uh, among those top five, Aaron Kiviharyu, who we are going to talk about in our under 18 world championship segment. So that is my very, very instant reaction to NHL central scouting. I don't think there's a lot of controversy there. I think as you get further down the first round board, a lot of people have a lot of different ideas about how this draft is going to go. And so I think that that's going to be something that we will continue to watch and continue to monitor. And as I go to the under 18 world championship, that's certainly something where, um, you know, where we're going to see a little bit more separation. I think guys like Cole Eiserman have a lot to prove. Some of the other players in the U.S. under 18 team, you know, who does make the Canadian roster? Guys like Liam Greentree will, should be there, you know. So there will be an opportunity for them to to leave a good last impression. And as we move towards that and then certainly get ready for um, the – the upcoming NHL scouting combine, the draft. There's so much more to go as we get into the postseason. But that is what we will end it on there. Can't wait for the NHL draft stuff. Plenty more to come as the NHL draft, uh, NHL season ends. You can expect a mock draft from me on flowhockey.tv. So keep an eye out for that. We will talk about that when we convene next time for the podcast. All right, well, let's get to a little bit of conversation about what you're going to be able to watch on Flow Hockey starting this week. On Wednesday, the ECHL's Kelly Cup playoffs will begin right here on Flow Hockey. Make sure you are signed up for that because there are a lot of great matchups. As I mentioned, they start Wednesday. We've got the opening round. It's the divisional semifinals. 16 teams are in the playoffs, and it will get down to one to award the Kelly Cup. So I just wanted to catch you up on some of the storylines to keep an eye on as we go into the first round because there's plenty there. The first off 
the Kansas City Mavericks. They won the Brabham Cup as the regular season champions. Pretty much one of the best seasons that they've had as a franchise in the ECHL. They're getting a major opportunity here. They'll play Tulsa in the Mountain Division semifinals. Tulsa getting in on the last day of the season. The Mavericks had a bit of an interesting end to the season. They played the Iowa Heartlanders. Uh, and then Max Sergeyev, who is one of their top scorers, uh, and a rookie this year, one of the best rookies in the ECHL, uh, came off the bench for an altercation, got suspended. So that is going to be something that kind of hangs over their first round series. Now, they have the depth. And the thing that you look at them, excellent goaltending is what they have. Jack LaFontaine and Kale Morris, two guys that won the Mike Richter Award as the top goalie in college hockey. Morris for Notre Dame, LaFontaine for Minnesota. And they are the goalie tandem for this team. So Really, you can't go wrong with either of those two guys. It looks like Jack LaFontaine, who is under contract with the Coachella Valley Phantoms, will have a better opportunity to, to play some games down the stretch here. But that's a team with guys like Jeremy McKenna, who played in the Calder Cup playoffs last year for Coachella Valley. <coughs> Excuse me. And a few others that are really interesting um, that, that can produce. And I got to see him up close. I was at the Iowa Heartlanders game uh, broadcasting with my partner, David Fine, there. And to see this team up close, you see the skill level, you see do, and you see that they're going to be a problem in the playoffs for a lot of teams. And it'll start with Tulsa. Another team that I'll be having my eye on is a team that finished with the best, just the hottest end to a regular season you could ask for, the Toledo Walleye. They won 14 straight games going into the postseason. They have the the leading scorer in the ECHL and Brandon Hawkins, who led in goals and points, 40 goals for him this season in 72 games and they will be playing one of their closest natural opponents, the Kalamazoo wings. It'll be short travel for these teams in terms of the playoff series. Toledo always packs them in at the Huntington center for uh, their games. They are an outstanding uh, you know, team. Pat Mikesh in his first season with them has really helped get that team playing their best hockey at the right time of year. The central division was real packed in the mid tier, but at the top Toledo really pulled far away and there was nobody close. So they're going to have a tough matchup with Kalamazoo as a really good goaltender in Jonathan Lemieux, who was uh, from the Abbotsford Canucks and under contract in the AHL. He's been outstanding in multiple viewings this season, but the Toledo walleye with Brandon Hawkins and a number of other players from the Detroit Red Wings organization, they should get some help there and that'll allow them to, you know, get, get into some really meaningful games here. Uh, Toledo has never won the Kelly Cup. They've been among the top teams in the regular season, but when it comes to the playoffs, they just haven't gotten over the hump. Is this the year? This might be one of their best opportunities. But a team that's there all the time, a team that is always in the hunt, and a team that is now the two-time defending champion, Florida Everblades, are looking to three-peat here. So the South Division is always a tough division. There's always good quality hockey in that division. We're waiting to see exactly what Florida can do. They're coming in as the number three seed in their division. Can they battle and get through the first round? That always seems to be one of the toughest steps for a defending championship team. But the Florida Everblades certainly would love to become the first team in the history of the ECHL to win three straight Kelly Cups. And certainly nobody's going to count them out. They've had continuity. They have experience. They have battle-tested players. They have a goaltender in Cam Johnson that's been there before. So they will open up their first-round series against the Jacksonville Icemen, who have been a really solid team throughout this entire year. Another team I'm keeping an eye on is the Norfolk Admirals. They have really turned a corner they were really struggling in the last couple of years. They are in their first ECHL postseason. And Norfolk, of course, was an, uh, a former AHL market. You'll recall the Tampa Bay Lightning kind of built their whole Stanley Cup dynasty on the Norfolk Admirals that, that set a, uh, a pro hockey record for winning streak and then won the Calder Cup under John Cooper, who, of course, went on to the, be the head coach and has won multiple Stanley Cups with the Tampa Bay Lightning. So that is uh, a great thing for Norfolk. They have not been in a postseason in, in 10 years. So 10 years without postseason hockey, they will play Trois Rivières. Uh, I believe that series starts in Trois. Uh, so that will be an opportunity for the Norfolk Admirals to bring postseason hockey back to a market that has had pro hockey for a long, long time. And those are among the series. I mean, every series you, you want to watch, there's going to be great hockey. Best of seven, intensity, uh, you know, a lot on the line. And 
really, when you get down to this stage of the season, everybody is vying for that Kelly Cup. Everybody wants to end their season on a high note, and that is what we will see here. So you will be able to watch the entirety of those playoffs on flowhockey.tv or via the Flow Sports app. Make sure you are signed up. You will not want to miss a second of the action. Also, we've got some draft, you know, we kind of go back to our draft discussion because I want to talk a little bit about the USHL playoffs and the the Clark Cup is starting. It actually already started as we record this on Tuesday. First round started on Monday. And so the Clark Cup is a very interesting playoff format. You have a best of three series. The top two teams in each conference get buys to the second round. The first round, it is really a best of three series. You have one bad night. It suddenly turns into you're on the brink of elimination. We had some very exciting matchups in the opening night of the playoffs. I don't want to, you know, talk about the what what has happened so far because it'll become stale really quickly. But the thing about the USHL Clark Cup playoffs is we saw last year the Youngstown Phantoms went on a run. They won the Clark Cup. I, I believe seven or eight players from that team ended up getting drafted. You know, so this is a, a meaningful time of year. This is where guys that are, that are eligible for the draft can really separate themselves. We talk about guys like Michael Hage, essentially dragging Chicago into the playoffs this year with the way that he played. Um, we'll have, we'll see Sasha Boisvert. We'll see Matt Bay Gridden, some of the other top players that are draft eligible, you know, guys like Max Swanson from the Fargo force. He's got a lot to prove. He's a smaller player. He's, you know, down the list on draft rankings because of his size, but over the last two seasons, he's been among the best USHL players. Can he do enough in the postseason to prove that he belongs as a NHL draft pick? That will absolutely be part of what we want to see from him in this coming in the in the coming weeks and months. Uh, uh, really, more weeks because the 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 USHL Clark Cup playoffs are more of a sprint than a marathon uh, that some of the other playoffs are. But, I mean, so many good draft-eligible players that are eligible there. And also NHL-drafted players. You look at the Green Bay Gamblers, Julian Lutz, uh, Jason Chagabe, Adam Guyon, all guys that are, are significant NHL prospects playing in this tournament. You know, there's plenty of other players as well from other teams like, like Beckett Hendrickson from the Dubuque Fighting Saints and, and others like that. But, you know, Fargo, Sioux City, Dubuque, and Muskegon all have that first-round buy. It was very important. And now everybody else is duking it out to get into that second round. But we will have the Clark Cup playoffs in their entirety on Flow Hockey. So you will definitely want to make sure to tune in. And really the team that I'm watching most for this postseason is the Fargo Force. They have gotten close. They had two years where they have won the Anderson Cup. They they made it a, a good effort last year. Didn't win the big one. This is going to be their opportunity. It's a heck of a team. They've got a lot of talent. They have good goaltending, a, a really good goaltending battery. You know, it doesn't matter which guy they have in the net. It seems like they're going to be able to get the saves that they need. So that is a team that I think, you know, they are coming in with a chip on their shoulder and they have the buy. They, they have to play their best hockey here. They have to get ready for their next series because I think that really it's Clark Cup or bust for them more than any other team based on the season that they've had. But you get into the playoffs, anything can happen, any team can win, and we will watch it all play out on flowhockey.tv. So definitely check that out. Make sure you are all over the Clark Cup playoffs, as I apparently forgot how to talk for a second. All right. As we move on from the Clark Cup playoffs, another very significant draft event is upon us. It will happen next, starting next week in Finland. I will be heading over to Finland to cover this tournament in its entirety. I'll be following Team USA, Team Canada, Team Sweden, Team Finland, all the teams that will have draft-eligible players, which is all of them. We will have extensive coverage on Flow Hockey, so make sure that you are Stay, staying tuned to our Flow Hockey social media channels at Flow Hockey across most platforms at Flow Hockey TV on TikTok. And this is really um, one of my favorite tournaments. One, it's a prelude to the World Junior Championship, which is my favorite tournament. So you get that as well. So you go uh, U18s is basically a preview of all the players that you're going to see at the World Juniors next year or many of the players that you're going to see at the World Juniors next year. It's also, you know, I came from the national team development program, started, you know, my, my hockey career with USA hockey. Um, and, and this was the tournament where I kind of was able to be around these players and see firsthand how much one, this tournament means to players of that age. These are mostly high school seniors that we're talking about here. 
but you also see the maturation of players over the course of a tournament. You see guys step up in big moments. You think back years and years. Last year, it was Will Smith setting uh, or tying the American single tournament scoring record. Uh, Ryan Leonard stepping up and scoring the golden goal. And where do those guys go? They're top 10 draft picks just a couple months later. So this is really one of the best events that you can watch to see high-end draft eligible talent. Unfortunately, a lot of the story lately has been about the guys that won't be there. Caden Lindstrom, Berkeley Catton, Consta Hellenius, if he ends up making Finland's senior national team, he won't be available for a tournament that they're hosting, and he's clearly the top player in the age group, like by uh, 700 miles. So, you know, we'll be watching what happens there. Unfortunately, Anton Frondel, an underage player, a guy that could pressure James Higgins for number one next season, he is also unavailable for this tournament for Sweden. So that's another loss. But there will be a number of guys projected into the first round and guys that you will need to know heading into this NHL draft and the next NHL draft. And we'll start a little bit talking about Team Sweden. So uh, the World Under-18 Championship here is one of my favorites that we can do. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the one of the times where you just really get to see that separation and it's really important obviously at the, at the national team development program they de they develop their players going towards you know this this tournament uh, everything builds up this is their finale there will be two players that are among the best that they've had in recent memory James Higgins and Cole Eiserman that you know they were on the team last year that won gold but this is their age group so that changes the dynamic for them so if you want to you know, really solidify your NTDP legacy, it usually has to be with a gold medal. Those are the teams that will, you know, be in the annals of history as, as among the best. And really what we've seen this year is that this U.S. under-18 team, they've struggled internationally. They have not won the smaller tournaments, the four and five nation tournaments that's been won by Sweden. Um, so there is a bit of, you know, kind of nerves, I would say, going into this tournament. There are going to be some underage players they've called up. There are going to be some outside players that they've called in to kind of help out with this tournament. But the focus is going to be so central on Cole Iserman and James Higgins. Now, James Higgins not draft eligible until 2025. Cole Iserman draft eligible this year and started the year as the projected number two prospect and is slowly kind of slid a little bit further down the rankings. I don't think he goes outside of the top 15. I don't think he should go outside of the top 15. He is an elite goal scorer. He's eight goals away from tying Cole Caulfield's single or, or career record of goals, 126 goals over two seasons for Cole Caulfield. Caulfield had 72 in his under 18 season. That's not going to happen for Iserman, but he is potentially going to have, you know, if he can score eight goals in this tournament, he had nine in last year's tournament, then, you know, he's tied with, with Cole Caulfield. He's also averaging a goal per game this year. And I think, you know, we we pick these players apart so much and sometimes the simplest explanation, he is a goal scorer, he scores goals, that's going to be his job. That is going to be what he has to do. So he is going to have to, to, to show that he can be uh, a, a very top-tier player by doing what he does best, but also showing a little bit more. Um, you know, I think that, Cole Eiserman has been criticized as being too one-dimensional, too much of a goal scorer, not enough of a driver. Um, and I think in this tournament, his role is going to be to score goals. It, you know, there, can he play better defensively? Can he play better off the puck? Absolutely. But score goals. And if he does that, that will help his draft stock. I'm really intrigued by James Hagens in this as well, as the underager. I think he's starting to gain more challengers for the first overall pick. He, he's the guy that a lot of people have looked at as the number one pick for, for next year. But you look at Anton Frundell, who will not be in this tournament. You look at other players that are, are draft eligible for next season, Michael Misa, others. You know, there is going to be a target on James Higgins' back. And as one of the drivers of this team, he's going to have to do a lot. And so I think that we'll be watching him. We'll be watching the goaltending of Team USA. They are bringing in Caleb Heil from the Sioux Falls Stampede. Um, you know, they've, they've got some good goaltending already in, in that group. Um, but, you know, do they who, – who gets the starting job? So there's a lot of questions for Team USA going into this tournament. We don't have Canada's roster yet either, but I am fully expecting them to, to ice a very competitive team. We'll wait and see. They could get Tija Ginla from Kelowna. They could – you know, they, they should have Liam Greentree. 
They're not going to have, as we mentioned, Catton or Lindstrom. Um, they're not going to have Zane Parekh. They're not going to, you know, there's there's a number of guys that they're not going to be able to call upon for this tournament that are top 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 of the lineup players. But they still have really good depth in this class, and they should be able to put put together an, a competitive team. Finland, if they don't get Kansa Hellenius, what does that mean for their chances? You know, does do the Czechs kind of sneak in here? Do they have enough? I'm not sure. I've seen them play internationally a few times. If they don't have their best players, it's been really tough for them to compete. So we'll see where everything ends up. We'll see where all things line up. But I'm really fascinated to find out what happens next with um, with this under-18 championship. I think it's a really exciting group of players that we're going to have over in Finland. Um, I'll be there. Make sure you are staying tuned to Flow Hockey. We'll have a lot of player interviews. We will have uh, analysis. We will have scouting reports. We will have so much more. And as I mentioned, we're going to have mock drafts, new draft rankings. All of those things are coming. So uh, make Flow Hockey tv one of your essential destinations for nhl draft coverage i'll be doing a lot of it there will be a lot more now that we've gotten through the college season now we're into the postseason everything kind of takes care of itself a lot of my focus will be on the nhl draft and certainly at the world under 18 championship where i'm very excited uh, to spend some time in finland and watch these players as they get ready for what should be a very exciting tournament and we will be bringing you uh at least my my analysis and writing and also a lot of player interviews while I'm over there uh, in Finland. So really can't wait to get there. Well, that's pretty much all I got for you today. I mean, there's a lot. Of, I, I wanted to get through some uh, Q&As, but unfortunately, uh, there's just too many too many topics to get through today. And uh, obviously excited about this time of year. Uh, excited about the playoffs. Don't forget to subscribe to Flow Hockey so that you can get the ECHL Kelly Cup playoffs, the Clark Cup playoffs, um, all of the, the, you, the BCHL, the CJHL, all these different leagues that you can get. Uh, and it's the best time of year. Who, who doesn't love playoff hockey? I know I do. So make sure you get signed up. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to this podcast on your podcast app of choice or watch us on YouTube and Flow Hockey or via the Flow Sports app. All right, folks, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Talking Hockey Sense. My name is Chris Peters. We'll catch you next time.